Hi, I'm Becky Mayer and welcome to Transitions Body, Mind, Spirit. This show is all about remarkable people, everyday people, regular folks, your friends, your neighbors. And it's a metaphor of transitions is like triathlons. You swim, then you go to a transition area and change to bike, and then you transition again and you run. So life is all like a big triathlon, actually. And today we have an amazing guest, Christy Seehafer. Hi. Thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. Christy has an amazing story. And her story is uh, she's not only a symphonic violinist, she, she's with the Nashville Symphony, but she had a life-changing occurrence happen to her in her health. And that's what we want to find out. How did she transition from perfect health to, oops, there's something different now, and being a breast cancer survivor? Because we all want to know, how, how do you do this? So Christy, tell us a little bit about your life before your diagnosis and how you found out about having breast cancer. And tell us a little bit about that. Well, I've been with the symphony for 21 years, um, and we found this a little over two years ago. Um, before my diagnosis, I was very much involved in my job. And being a, a being violinist. And it's, it's a very socially isolating job hmm. for a lot of reasons. You know, you're spending your time practicing alone, and you work at nights on the weekends when everybody else is having fun. Mm -hmm. um, so then this diagnosis happened pretty much out of the blue. Um, I have no family history of cancer and I was diagnosed four months after a clean mammogram. And by the time I got my full diagnosis, I was at stage four. So. And could you explain what that means and how, how did you even, after four, uh, having a mammogram four months before, how did you even know that, oh, there's something up? And what does stage four mean? Well, um, I was doing a lot of running at the time. And one thing I want to tell everybody is that you have to be your own best advocate and you mm -hmm. have to be aware of your body. And I was training for a marathon, so I was doing a lot of running, and I was really aware of what my body was telling me. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened, I, I remember I was doing a half marathon in Louisiana, and um, I hope this isn't too graphic for the audience, but no, I, I go took, right ahead. I, I was, after the marath half marathon was over, I was gonna get in the shower, I took off my running bra, and I noticed a flat spot and that just didn't look right to me. And I, I sort of thought it was just from all the running. So mm. it took uh, about another month and a half until I realized that something needed to be looked at mm. um, because I got my period and uh, things were swelling a little bit. Mm. And I thought, okay, this is, this is something that needs to be looked at. It wasn't at. normal. It wasn't normal. Things were not normal and you so just felt something's not right. Something just wasn't right even though I just didn't know what it was. And mm -hmm. I almost apologized to my doctor for going to see her because huh. I had just had a clear mammogram four months before. Wow. But she took me seriously even though she didn't find anything. Hmm. And she referred me to a specialist who I saw the very next day. Wow. The specialist couldn't find anything by physical examination, but mm -hmm. she had an ultrasound in her office. Hmm. And that's when we found the lump and we had it biopsied and um, got, I got the news on April 20th of 2010. So I guess it is almost b about two years, three, when three you, years. W again, when you say stage four, what does that mean? Stage four, they, all cancers are staged based on how invasive and how large they are. Uh -huh. And uh, stage four, it used to be stage four was a death sentence huh. because it meant that it had spread past. Stage four now means it, it was in the lymph nodes, it was outside of the breast, in the lymph nodes, and it had spread to my bones. Wow. Um, so technically, most insurance companies say that stage four is not curable. Wow. And I suppose that I will be faced with that sort of mindset by the insurance companies. 
Mm. Even though, according to my last PET scan, I am cancer free. Cancer free, hooray! Mm -hmm. And that's, it's been two years since your diagnosis? Three years. Three years. Three years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think. Let me think. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I, I can't get it. St t two years. Two years. Two years. Yes. Okay. Um, April 20th, 2011. So okay. Chemo brain is, is very real. Yeah. Um, but uh, so they said stage four, mm -hmm. and then it's like yikes. Yeah, which meant full chemo, full radiation, um, and uh, thank you to my doctor for never giving me a prognosis. What what does that mean? Not giving you a, a prognosis? Explain well, that. Well, you know, like on the old TV shows, they say, well, you only have so many weeks to live or months to ah. live. And he never gave me a prognosis. I knew very well what stage four meant. I used to work in a hospital. Mm. And I knew how serious it was, but at the same time, it was, when I got that news, it was so ludicrous. It was just the most ridiculous thing ever. Meaning, what part was ridiculous? The fact that, uh, here I was, I, I was training for a marathon, and then boom, I get this diagnosis, and. When we first found it, we thought, well, we found it early. It looks small, mm -hmm. and it looks like maybe stage one, you know. And then we did the surgery, and it was stage two, but it had gone into the lymph nodes, so it was stage 2B. But since it had gone into the lymph nodes, I had to do chemo. And before chemo, they do a PET scan. And that's when they found that it was in the bones. In the bones. So that put me automatically at stage four. Wow. And so I, I went through this within just a matter of weeks. Hmm. And, and it just was like, I, this is stupid. I'm not accepting this. This is ridiculous. It's not right for me. Hmm. And my whole attitude the whole time was, well, let's just get it treated so I can get on with my life. And so you took it as it's not a death sentence. It's, it's serious, but hey, let's just take care of it. Yeah. Is that what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it was so far out of left field for what hmm. I had expected in my life. Mm -hmm. Because I come from a family of very long-lived women. Hmm. And, and men, but women especially, mm -hmm. and nobody with cancer. We, hmm. I was worried about the heart disease, diabetes thing. All the other things. All the other things. I was on, and, and I was eating right. I was exercising. Everything you say you're supposed to do to you're be doing healthy. Right. So I was doing it. Um, and then this just pops up out of the blue. And so it was just ridiculous. So I just... Wow. Wow. So the, g give us the time schedule. You found out wow, this could be serious, you had your operation, you had your chemo, and then, and then what? And we have a picture of you uh, bald doing, um, uh, was that uh, Music City? It was the Women's Half Marathon. The Women's Half Marathon. So somehow or other, you were able to do a half marathon, bald? <laughs> <laughs> um, I felt that I really needed to prove to myself that uh, I was going to be able to conquer this. Mm -hmm. And so about a month after I finished chemo mm -hmm. was the women's half marathon. And mm -hmm. I had I'd done it once before the previous year. Um, and I, I figured I could walk it. My legs were still really giving me trouble. But mm -hmm. if I could walk an 18 minute mile, mm -hmm. I could finish it. So I found a friend to walk it with me. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, I was actually dragging her to keep up the time. Ah. But uh, I managed to, f to finish it just within the time limit. Um, and I tried to do a little uh, jump in the air at the end, but I almost fell because my legs were just completely spent. Wow. But, but I did it. Yes. I finished it. And yes. I was able to do it. Wow. So. And we, well, we're going to show a picture of that, which is pretty, just amazing. Amazing. Uh, there she is, full of life totally bald and we also didn't you say you had only one wig well um i wore a wig only once i actually had one i got one from the american cancer society uh -huh. um, because there was going to be a photo shoot with the symphony and i thought i should have something like that but as it turns out i was too sick to go to that photo shoot uh. so i didn't need it but i had a wig that i wore on the fourth of july and it was a bright blue wig and we're going to have and a shot of that, too. Yeah, and yeah. that's the only time I wore a wig. Otherwise, I just went with scarves. Mm -hmm. um, before I lost my hair, I had a little party. 
w at my hairdressers, I had some friends come along. While he shaved my head, they were toasting me with tequila. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And, um, it was wow. a lot of fun. Well, let me ask you, this journey, which has been two years, and you are pronounced cancer-free, how has this changed you in your life? Because I know you are an introvert. Your natural way is being an introvert. Mm -hmm. And 20-some years of the symphony being introverted and, you know, not, and working on weekends and all that. How has that changed now for you? Well... I, I'm still an introvert. I will always be an introvert. But I realize that um, I, I need to constantly be expanding my circle of friends. And there were a lot of people on the periphery of my life mm -hmm. that I needed to get back in touch with. Mm -hmm. And I also just needed to have more people around me to have more fun in my life. Mm -hmm because I just wasn't having any fun. And how have you done that? Um, well, I've, I've just made it an effort to get to know everybody I'm friends with on Facebook ah. um, and get to know my neighbors. Uh, it's amazing how you can talk, you, you interact with people every day and never really know them. Right. So I was making it a point to at least learn one new person's name a day and talk with one new mm. person a day. Mm -hmm. I've also started a networking market, a network marketing business on the side that I... Is that your travel? Yes, uh -huh. yes. And you need to know people to be successful at right. that. Right. Um, and so I'm working on my skills with people. Right. Um, and didn't you do a triathlon? Yes. I've... Uh, this last summer, I actually did um, two triathlons. I did two, two, tri two triathlons. Yeah, but <laughs> I do want to get back to, to really running, but triathlons are, are really fun in a way that I can keep active um, mm -hmm. and keep my mind active and my body active. Right, and swim, bike, run, and uh, Christy is just an amazing example of grit and um, amazing musician and we're going to have uh, a little bit of her music also just to give you an idea and uh, Christy thank you so much for being with us it you are an inspiration and it just seems like attitude is so important and you got the really right is. attitude mm -hmm. thank you for being with us thanks for having me all right <laughs> another guest, Tanya Bell Jarbo. She's going to tell how she has transitioned from different parts of her life. And as a cancer survivor, how has that changed her whole attitude or not? Or what is different? And she has an interesting background. Not only her and her husband have a, a video firm, but she is a fly fisher woman and uh, has some very interesting things to tell us. So welcome, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me on. Yes, tell us how and when you were diagnosed with cancer, what type, and how do you even found out and when that happened? Um, I was diagnosed uh, uh, with a stage two breast cancer uh, December uh, the 19th, 2006, 
uh, I was in perfect health. I had not been to the doctor, uh, almost perfect attendance on my job every day. But uh, what happened was I was in a, a series of um, three car wrecks uh, within a period of less than two years. Wow. None of them were my fault, but I tell people don't get in the car with me. But uh, what happened was um, um, I was rear-ended and the, the last car wreck. And um, of course my neck was messed up from the first car wreck, which mm. was I was T-boned from, from the side. Mm. And I had been going to a, a chiropractor and um, after going to him for about uh, uh, three months, I told him one day, I said, you know, my neck is still hurting. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, uh, go home and, and lay your head over the back of the bed to put the curvature back in your neck. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So um, I shared that information with my husband and well, he just thought it was stupid, but anyway, I did it anyway, because my doctor told me to, right? right. So um, I, uh, on a regular regimen, twice a day, eight minutes, laid my head on the back of the bed. So I thought, okay, while well, I'm here, uh, I'll fill around for lumps. Okay. Well, um, I, um, felt a lump in my l right side and I, I of course it alarmed me and um, I jumped up and uh, called the doctor to get my very first mammogram at that point. You never had a mammogram? No, I never had a mammogram. And you I were was, what age? Uh, 44. Okay. 44 years old. Okay. So um, um, when I get there, they ask me if I have a lump, and I said yes. They said which side? I said the right side. So um, uh, I, they they put me back in a holding room because they wanted to take extra pictures. Mm -hmm. So when I get back uh, to the spot where they wanted to take additional photos, um, they said, "Well, you know, you're fine, but come back in six months." Hmm. We found a spot in the right, in the, no, excuse, we found a spot in the left side. Is this your breast? Yes, okay. yes. And um, previously, but before I left the office that day, they had, uh, they did an ultrasound on the area that I felt the lump in when I was lying on the back of the bed. Mm -hmm. They said it was uh, a rib. So a rib. Yes, they okay. said it was a rib. So you know, I was happy about that. I go home that night, and I said, "Hey, Harold, you know uh, that spot that I thought was lump? It was a rib." And he said, "Well, let's celebrate." Huh. So I go out and get sushi, and come back to the house, and of course, you know, um, uh, we're celebrating. But I recollected the conversation I had with the doctor before leaving the, the examining room, mm -hmm. and they said, you have calcification. Uh, that was the spot where they wanted to take a second look. Mm -hmm. uh, so they said, come back in six months. Mm -hmm. So that was in March of um, uh, 2006, but I didn't go back to the doctor until December of uh, 2006. And so they did a diagnostic mammogram, and uh, the doctor there said, uh, calcifications are little white dots. Mm -hmm. You have more white dots. Mm. So which meant in that period of time it had grown, it had changed. So mm. they uh, ordered a biopsy. So a week later the biopsy confirmed malignancy. And confirmed that the white dots was a cancer? Yes. Okay. Yes. Wow. And that probably was a frightening thing. <sighs> yes, to say the least. Absolutely. Wow. And then what happened after that? Was it immediate, did you have chemotherapy or surgery or what happened? Um, January uh, 2007, mm -hmm. I had um, a, a lumpectomy and then about uh, six weeks later followed up with uh, 35 rounds of radiation. Radiation, so yes. it wasn't chemotherapy, it was radiation. Yes, I had radiation only. My uh, uh, medical oncologist felt that chemotherapy would have been overkill. Well, after you uh, had all your radiation and you deemed yourself cancer-free, yes. uh, how 
did that change your life? Uh, I think you, you had showed me this wonderful picture of you doing a um, marathon. Yes. Right? Yes, and yes. was that with Gilda's Club? or? Yes. The, I participate in their annual fundraiser called Gilda's Gang, which was inspired by Gail, Gail Adelstone. Uh, she was um, um, uh, a 37-year-old physician who died from breast cancer. Mm. And in fact, she she uh, uh, did the uh, the half marathon about two months before her death. So wow. Yeah. So Gilda's gang is um, uh, uh, Gilda's Club of Nashville, their annual and biggest fundraiser. Okay. And had had you done? things like that before your cancer diagnosis or has your life changed from that? Can you say there is a demarcation uh, and things changed and how did it change? Well, yes, in fact, uh, those are a cancer diagnosis is a big uh, life changing uh, event for you. Um, I'm, uh, I eat more healthier. I did before, but I'm more closely now. And as far as the marathons, mm -hmm. uh, my husband and I, well, we live in Hillsborough Village, and each year I would hear the marathon come through and the music playing, and each year I would say, hey, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that. But when I, um, about a month after treatment, um, I joined Gilda's Club and found out about the fundraiser and, and how it, um, was in with the uh, the marathon, so that was uh, a boost for me. So something you'd kind of been putting off, hey, I'm going to do the marathon. I'm, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, and finally, it was like, I guess I really am going to do it. And you have support with Gilda's Club, right? Oh, absolutely, full support, and not only that, full support from friends and relatives. Mm. Uh, I found out, you know. Uh, you, you surround yourself with people who will help you, and, and there are definitely wonderful people who will, will cheer you on and, and help build you back. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Now, I know that you're involved, and that's how I met you, with another organization, Casting for Recovery, Music City Fly Girls. They're going to be having yes. a, uh, their annual fundraiser April the 7th. Sunday at the factory uh, and tell me about this wonderful program that I believe they did their first one and you were one of the participants for Casting for Recovery here in Nashville, Tennessee. Yes, uh, Casting for Recovery is an organization headquartered up in Vermont uh, that's been going on uh, for many years. Uh, it does help, uh, it, it exists to support women who have breast cancer. Um, uh, their first um, uh, retreat was held here in Middle Tennessee in 2009. I was one of the first participants. I signed up for it and I got the call and uh, it's, it's really, really a wonderful organization. And the Music City Fly Girls, uh, local fly fishing uh, group for women, uh, support and host this event e each year. And that is a weekend that uh, is given to the women participants, and there's medical counseling and psychological counseling, and you're paired one-on-one -on -one with a fly fisher person, right? Yes, absolutely. That's the absolutely. right way to say that. Fly, uh, there's men and women, and fly, <laughs> it's not a fly fisher man, it's not a fly fisher woman. Uh, what do you say? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you just get out there and, and Throw your ride out there, you know. <laughs> and uh, you are wearing your fly fisher uh, person gear, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. This is an example mm -hmm. of her great outfit. And can you kind of tell us what is going on here? We have boots and special pants, and tell us about that. Yes, this is my fly fishing outfit. This is when I get into deep water. <laughs> um, these are my chest waders. And of course, this is my vest that uh, I wear uh, when I'm uh, uh, in some of the wonderful creeks and lakes around uh, Tennessee. 
And what about what's on your feet? Well, actually, these are my, my boots are missing this time, uh, but uh, there are special boots, of course. They're called wading boots or wading shoes that uh, you wear. And of course, th these are just dry socks, and this all is totally waterproof, so all the way up to my chest. So, how deep is it? Well, you don't. Well, for me personally, I don't want to get in too deep of water. No more than. Uh, up to maybe a little above my waist. That's about as deep as I really want to get into because sometimes there are holes in the in the water that you don't see so you want to be careful to be able to maintain good footage while you're out there. And I know you don't have a fishing rod with you today but can you give you us with an imaginary fishing rod the proper way to cast? Yes, I can do that. <laughs> Well, first of all, you have to, you definitely have to hold the rod correctly and, and hello, it's for you. So this is the, this is the way I was taught. Hello, oh, it's, it's for, for you. you. So you try to form that beautiful S out in the sky before uh, landing it in. Wonderful. Now are you, you are really hooked on uh, fly fishing? Oh yes, it's really great. Uh, the Music City Fly Girls go on annual um, trips um, uh, due to my schedule, tight schedule. I haven't gone on, but they go to Montana and they just got back from Colorado this past fall. So uh, it's, uh, it's really therapeutic to get out there and with nature and water and, and all the healing properties uh, of, uh, of the world and, and just be healed from all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and, and would you say that uh, you, would you have done something like fly fishing before your cancer diagnosis? Mm, probably not. No. I had thought about it, but, um, you know, like I said, I, I um, was diagnosed December the 19th, 2006. And well, really and truly, I've, I've come to call it my, my Christmas gift because it's through hmm. that uh, I have met so many uh, wonderful people and have opportunities that otherwise I never would have had. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's um, it's it's been a good thing, you know. It's a blessing and a curse. Wow! Yeah. Is there anything that uh, you would want our audience to know if if somebody is diagnosed with cancer? Anything that you would advise them? Well, yes, I would say um, uh, don't panic. Don't panic. Get all the information that you can to enhance your your quality of life and uh, pay co close close attention to your body. You know, um, you, I um, my medical team. I appreciate them to the highest, but you have to take care of yourself. And um, uh, my my faith in God has really gotten me over the humps. Wonderful. Well, Tanya, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story. Yeah. Have a good night. <laughs>